One of the myths for December 21st, 2012 is that the Earth's axes are going to somehow shift. The rotation axis can't shift because of the orbit of the moon around the Earth stabilizes it and doesn't allow it to shift. The magnetic field does shift from time to time, but the last time it did it was 740,000 years ago, and it doesn't uh, do that sort of a shift, but every half a million years or so. There's no evidence that's going to happen in December, and even if it were to be shifting, it takes thousands of years to do so. And even if it did shift, it's not going to cause a problem on the Earth, apart from the fact that we're going to have to recalibrate our compasses. This phenomenon is called pole shift, in which the entire mantle of the Earth would shift in a matter of days, perhaps hours, changing the position of the North and South Pole, causing worldwide disaster. Earthquakes would rock every continent. Massive tsunamis would inundate coastal cities. It would be the ultimate planetary catastrophe. As unlikely as this theory seems, it is backed by science. Albert Einstein first suggested it in 1955. And a new study from Princeton University reveals that the poles have shifted before. The North Pole rested in the middle of the Pacific 800 million years ago, placing Alaska at the equator. Even if this pole shift took place slowly over years, it would result in global climate change and shifting sea levels. If it took place rapidly, it would mean planet-wide disaster and mass extinction of species. Risks are... We're on our probably 23rd hour, Dermot, of a red alert status. Red alert means that it is raining intensely and, and uh, intensely to a point where uh, when I was reporting a, a couple of hours ago, I, I think I said it was about three and a quarter meters of water. And to give you an idea, you know, that, that's about half the height of a, of a human body in water that's fallen and that's not over a long period of time. That's 24 hours, that's overnight, one day, basically. Nine surrounding provinces have also been affected. As hundreds of people are dead or missing. Scientists believe that this collapse is a sign of a much bigger problem. NASA says its satellites have recorded what it calls unprecedented surface melting. The white areas in these images show the surface ice in Greenland on July the 8th. But only four days later, something extraordinary happened. Almost all of it melted, exposing the deeper blanket of ice that covers the country. 97% of Greenland was affected. Even Greenland's coldest and highest spot was affected, something that hasn't happened since 1889. Ash and smoke billow into the air above Mount Tongariro on New Zealand's North Island. The aftermath of a volcanic eruption, the first here since 1897. Scientists say they'd noticed increased seismic activity below the mountain for weeks. It's too early to say whether this is a one-off 
or the start of a new cycle of activity. We are under siege. The coast is booming. Its big swells are just pushing through this bay. See the tide and the waves are up about five or six foot and the vigorous winds are just pounding the New South Wales coast. Showers going sideways. Winds knocking towards 100 kilometres an hour. Now why is this happening? Why have we had 106 kilometre an hour winds across Sydney Harbour today? 102k across Newcastle. Out to sea, it's a whole different story. The ocean is putting on a show. Seven metre wave heights. A king tide has caused massive erosion on Gold Coast beaches, washing tons of sand back into the ocean. The tide, coupled with powerful swirls, left sand cliffs towering as high as five metres in some places. Rod, the erosion is so bad, eight beaches had to be closed this morning. All evidence of last night's big surf and high tide. I haven't seen something like it. Never. Never remember. The sea carved five metre cliffs from main beach to surface paradise. The drop's unbelievable. At Nobby Beach, the protective rock wall is almost fully exposed. I never thought the day would come where I have to tiptoe across the rocks at Nobby's Beach to go for a surf. And that has council engineers worried. That's sort of your last line of defence. There's an Arctic storm going on as well as an Antarctic storm. They're seeing significant changes in the Una Bremen sea ice concentration map. That large patch of sea ice in the East Siberian Sea is almost entirely detached from the main ice pack. This is something I've never seen before. It's unprecedented in the satellite era. We have speculated a lot about this in previous melting seasons, but now the moment seems to have finally arrived. The sinkhole grew overnight. Infrared equipment shows it's 10 to 20 feet wider. The sinkhole expanded to the north and south. The summer of wild weather, the hottest July on record crippling drought in half the country, and now tropical storms are bringing epic rains to the east coast. Well, the earth is shaking in Southern California. At least 30 quakes striking since Tuesday night. Just yesterday, four mid-sized quakes hit. They were centered near and around Orange County. The strongest in magnitude 4.5, you definitely can feel that. And it was felt across a wide swath of that region. Recent studies have suggested that a swarm of smaller quakes sometimes comes before a big quake. A pair of strong earthquakes, both measuring more than 6.3 on the Richter scale, has leveled at least six villages in northwestern Iran and damaged dozens of others. Iranian state TV has reported a heavy death toll. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Hey folks. Some of you know that our magnetopause reversal video was posted to Godlike Productions and has well over 25,000 hits. After reading the 14 pages of responses, I feel the need to clarify exactly what information is known and what is fact versus speculation. This is a select few magnetic data feeds of Earth available at ISWA, the first link below. The sun is off to the right in this view, blowing solar wind from right to left. If you've spent any time studying geomagnetics, you're aware that you're seeing a normal view of the magnetosphere uh, and magnetopause, other than a moderate pressure change indicated by the change in color. But did you notice the timestamps here? There's data missing from March 12th around 1400 UTC, and it jumps to March 13th at 2100, more than a day later. I've staggered the videos here so they jump at different times to make it easier for you to see. Now if you go to any of these other ionospheric or magnetospheric data feeds, the data will be missing for that time. I'll just pick this one here, set up the right time frame, and the data on ISWA feeds up to your chosen time, so pick the end time of the view you want to watch. Now the best visual representations of this kind of stuff actually come from the Japanese simulation, some of you call it the NICT. But their videos have not updated in some time, and their image archive has been hidden since the data time uh, missing in question on the NASA data. 
Well, as most of you know, it's okay because we caught the data before they hit it, and here it is. In absolute contrast to all that we know is possible, the magnetosphere appears to reverse uh, the magnetopause that is it appears we have something coming from behind us pushing in on us a lot of people have said the solar wind doesn't do that yeah no kidding but it doesn't change the fact that you see what you see now we still don't know exactly what happened but I can tell you that those who say that the legend counter stopped indicating a glitch should look at the lower right portion to see the legend active during the reversal those who claim there is no evidence of anything hitting us around that time one large circle was quite rare and indicative of massive cosmic ray burst. A blob like this is unheard of, and look when it happens. Many have pointed to this article, and it presents a whole new set of concerns, but it talks about dayside reversals, and this was a dark side event, and involved cosmic rays. The evidence that something happened at around 1600 on March 12th is overwhelming, even before you consider that the data is now missing from every source. All the necessary links are below, folks. Make up your own mind. Be safe. When I asked those guys on that video that I've been showing from NASA what they thought about the magnetopause reversal, this was their response. It says, okay, at that time the density sensor was down because density is part of the calculation. The resulting model is simply broken. NASA then removed a broken model Another user asked NASA this in the video, and here's the link. This does not constitute hiding data. The original data is all there, or hiding a reversal, which never happened. The problem is your lack of understanding of the magnetopause reversal data to begin with. First, it's not data. It's a model derived from data. If you look at the data, you can find various data used in the calculation. Note density is one of them and the source ACE. Now if you head to solarmonitoring.org and bring up ACE and then plasma and you can see the three data streams of which ACE density is used. Go to the date 3, 12, 3, 12, 13, 12. And you know what? I went and checked the, the data and in fact on March 13th the density data was gone but you know what I looked another day I went to March 14th there was no density data but yet the magnetopause is perfectly normal so to me I don't know how they're coming up with these kind of excuses but it seems like they're they're just trying to find another way to lie A flexgate magnetometer works essentially like a compass. But instead of a spinning needle, electromagnets are used to measure magnetic fields. To build one, we start with a bar of ferromagnetic metal. If you wrap a coil of wire around the bar and run an electric current through it, the bar becomes magnetized and generates its own magnetic field. Reverse the current, and the field reverses direction. If you do this over and over again, you can see that the two directions cancel each other out. However, when an external magnetic field is present, the two directions are thrown out of balance, allowing you to measure the external field. Finally, by combining multiple flux gate sensors, you can measure a magnetic field in three dimensions. You're probably more familiar with magnetic fields than you realize. If you have a compass and a map, you can use the Earth's magnetic field to help you find your way. You've probably also seen what a magnetic field looks like. Drop iron filings around a bar magnet, and the field shows itself as a series of lines. If you take the filings away, you can still get an idea of what the field looks like by flying a tiny compass around the magnet. The compass points in the direction of the magnetic field, allowing you to draw its shape. But how do you find out what a planet's magnetic field looks like? You basically do the same thing. However, instead of flying a simple compass around the planet, NASA scientists use satellites carrying a much more sensitive device called a magnetometer. 
Mounted far away from the spacecraft, a magnetometer uses electric currents to measure the magnetic field of the planet. By flying this electronic compass around the planet, scientists can draw an accurate model of what its magnetic field looks like. And magnetometers have helped scientists discover more than just the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. Other planets in our solar system, such as Jupiter, have magnetic fields that are similar to ours. The Sun also generates its own magnetic field that affects the entire solar system. But not every planet in our solar system has a magnetic field. For example, we've discovered that, unlike Earth, Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field at all. Instead, it has small pockets of local magnetic fields. But after all said and done, even with all the advanced technology, the most amazing thing is that we've made all of these discoveries using something that's, essentially, an upgraded compass. On the left is a reverberation of magnetic instability from the CME impact two days ago. The right shows a newer, larger, and stronger compression of our magnetic field along with a multi-line resonance induced by that global field event. You can see it matches the space weather perfectly with the rise in solar wind density, speed, and temperature, signaling the impact of the second CME, which immediately sparked geomagnetic storms back to mid-levels. So how about flares? Activity is definitely picking up this morning, slowly but surely. The spot just south of center here is the culprit for today's uptick, gets bright at the end, and this is confirmed in 94 angstroms as SDO is taking a while to update. Especially interesting to get flares when you can clearly see the spots fading, but hey, it just takes one. We'll get you updates on any ejecta from those flares, and that's the news, folks. Be safe. Since the beginning of recorded time, there have been literally hundreds of thousands of predictions for the end of the world, and we're still here.